Hello and a warm welcome to everyone joining us, hopefully rejoining us for this, the third Athena 40 Global Conversation, Women's Leadership in Times of Crises. And as we all know, after a year of pandemic that has paralyzed practically every corner of the globe, we have been through crises and in many cases we are still confronting them. It is, of course, International Women's Day today, uh, and the theme for this year, 2021, is Choose to Challenge. It's organizers uh, issuing this rallying cry, which if you haven't read it, I will just read one or two lines from it. Uh, it says, we can all choose to challenge and call out gender bias and equality. We can all choose to seek out and celebrate women's achievements collectively, we can all help to create an inclusive world. A powerful statement, as they always are with this National Women's Day, but I was just thinking to myself, how well are we actually doing globally when it comes to diversity and women's leadership? I don't want to take you through a, a whole stream of international data, but I thought I'd start at home. Uh, I work for the BBC, uh, and as some of you will know, the BBC set up a pioneering 50-50 project a few years ago, which has been gathering data over the past few years. And it's beginning to produce some really interesting results. Just a few months ago, just to give you a few figures, 66% uh, of data sets featured 50% women contributors, 32% of women aged 25 to 34, say so they now consume more BBC online content before uh, than before because of greater female representation. So, so it's good uh, for business as well. But if we move from the small screen where I work to the bigger screen, and, and there's still a long way to go. Uh, did you know that only five women have ever been nominated for best director at the Academy Awards. And in 78 years, only five women uh, directors uh, have ever been nominated as well for a Golden Globe. Only two have won Best Director. Just for your information, uh, the first was 1983, Barbara Streisand uh, for Yentl. And then this year, again, Chloe Zhao for the brilliant Nomadland. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen that yet. I voted for it a few weeks ago at BAFTA, it's on Netflix. But when you look at that film and the sweep and the sensitivity and the compassion and actually the intellectual complexity, I for one don't think it could have been made by anyone really apart from a woman. So today, uh, to today, this is uh, Athena Forte's third uh, conversation and it's ambition and reach has gone even further than the first two years, thanks mainly to the extraordinary dynamism and the stamina of Elizabeth Filippouli, who we all know, and her Global Thinkers Forum. Panels joining us this year for the first time include Lagos, Nairobi, and Zagreb. They join our other panels in London, Beirut, Amman, and Karachi. Now, I want to introduce you all to the moderators and the panelists in a moment, and we will go through them around the world. But first of all, let's hear from Elizabeth. Hello, and welcome to the third Global Conversation organized by Global Thinkers Forum and uh, Athena 40 on International Women's Day. At Athena 40, our mission is to promote more women in leadership and to bring to the world new role models whose work and life will inspire us. Every March, through the Global Conversation, we connect leading women from different countries in a debate that discusses the role of women internationally, but we also focus on what is happening on the ground, the local stories, the local challenges, and how we can help amplify women's voices and make their issues known to other countries. For centuries, women have been struggling with domestic abuse, war, poverty, unpaid work, lack of access to education, lack of access to opportunities, as well as many more challenges. And the global pandemic did not make things easier for anyone, let alone women. Career-wise, 
we're hearing stories about women being appointed in top roles and participating at top tables, which is great. And it is fantastic to have the first female, first black, first Asian American vice president in the United States, Kamala Harris. Yet the truth of the matter is that women continue to be underrepresented and in fact, undervalued. We will discuss this later on. So do stay with us, but without further ado, I would like to hand over to Her Royal Highness, Princess Umayyah of Jordan, who is honoring us as our global keynote speaker today. A remarkable leader and a role model for women, not only in the Arab world, but internationally, for her dedicated work in the space of education, technology, science, and peace. But she's also known for her kindness, humility, and values. Let us welcome her. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and distinguished guests and fellow speakers, my dear Elizabeth, dear fellow members of the Athena 40 board and the Global Thinkers Forum, both editorial and production teams, I'm delighted to wish you all a very happy and purposeful International Women's Day 2021. The theme this year is one that we can all embrace as we look back at an unprecedented period of trial and of trauma. Choose to challenge. That is the call to women and men who care about equality, opportunity, access, and indeed, maximizing our value and potential as a human family. And I am delighted to welcome you to the third global conversation organized by Athena 40, an innovative platform that promotes female leadership by connecting women to mentoring, knowledge, networks, and opportunities. Under the banner of female leadership, in times of crisis, I know that we are going to hear from some, from some amazing and inspiring individuals today from all around the world. Together, we must all choose to challenge a status quo that deprives girls and women of an equal stake in our shared future. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced our world to pause and has challenged all of us to consider how we live. So many have suffered, whether economically, physically, or indeed emotionally. So many have died. We must ensure that all has passed and all that is still to come before we emerge must not be in vain. We must determine to learn from our experience and to reaffirm our belief in the importance of equal opportunity. To learn, to work, to achieve, to lead and to thrive. We cannot but feel proud of the women who have shone throughout the crisis. Indeed, women's unsurpassed leadership skills during the pandemic have been as revelatory to some as they have been absolutely unsurprising to us. Above all, we must never forget that empathy is certainly not a weakness. If anything, it is a superpower. Of course, women's representation in politics remains astoundingly low. Even in so-called advanced political arenas, we often sense that one step forward may quickly be followed by two steps back. And as we extol the virtues of shining female leadership around the world, we must not slip into a dangerous narrative. For why? Why should our girls think they must be infinitely better than their male colleagues simply to be considered for or respected in leadership roles? Isn't this all part of the narrative that implies that a woman's success is at the sufferance of men? Well, today we may choose to challenge that 
and so many other prejudices and preconceptions that help to question, devalue and undermine the place of women in all areas of social participation and leadership. My dear ladies and gentlemen, from challenge comes change. So let's all choose to challenge. Remember always that compassionate leadership is strong leadership. This is what truly benefits our world and benefits the future that we all deserve. I wish you every success and a very, very happy International Women's Day for all. God bless and Godspeed. Welcome to Athena 40. Athena 40 is a family of initiatives that promote female leadership and invite all leaders to embrace visionary and innovative thinking. By innovative thinking, we mean being open, curious and solutions focused. Athena 40 works closely with some of the most dynamic and innovative minds across all industries in order to promote gender diversity, inclusion and bring more women into decision making roles. We commit to enabling women to contribute to our economies. We believe that compassion and understanding are necessary values for our societies. We promote partnerships and ideas exchange among women and of course we include men in all conversations. We fight cliches and tribalism. We propose collaboration instead of segregation. We ignore labels and stereotypes. We recognize the value of diversity as a fantastic source of talent and knowledge. We stand for freedom of thought and expression. Our language speaks the truth. We stand for values-based decision-making and we fight polarization. We are broad-minded and inclusive. We believe in meaningful networking and the need to keep lifting each other up. We mentor, inspire, and motivate other women of all ages and backgrounds, helping them discover their own potential. We share and learn from each other's stories. Athena 40 welcomes everyone who wishes to be part of our mission and initiatives, an international community of vision, an ongoing global conversation, a movement for compassionate, innovative, future-proof leadership. Join us. Now, uh, in a normal world, I'm not sure if any of us really quite remember when that was, um, some of us would be sitting in the lecture theatre at Associated Newspapers, or organised uh, by Doug Wills, the emeritus uh, editor of the London Evening Standard. Like all of us, though, today, Doug uh, is not physically with us, but he is with us uh, via Zoom. Um, Doug, over to you. Well, um, a year ago, we were privileged to be able to host here in our offices in Kensington, the second global conversation organized by the inspirational Elizabeth and her team. Um, it's hard to believe how the world has changed since that day. Today, sitting here in Northcliffe House, there are five of us across the Independent and the Evening Standard. A year ago, there would have been 500. Everyone else is working remotely. Who would have credited that? Some things have changed, even here. Uh, the Evening Standard now has a woman editor, uh, Emily Sheffield. She's taken over the editor's chair from George Osborne. But many things in the world, Elizabeth particularly would say, have changed little. Among them, the opportunities for women to take up other seats of power. The why and how will no doubt be the questions and possibly the answers that we will follow and hear in this afternoon's discussions. So congratulations to the Athena 40 team in putting this together. And thank you and welcome to those taking part and Zooming in today, as opposed to being sat around in a theater or around a table. So let's all hopefully listen and learn from this afternoon. Doug was saying a little earlier, actually, that he was sitting alone in that office there with the mice. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting here in my flat, actually, with a puppy called Omar. So if you hear any licking uh, and wagging of tails, um, uh, it is him. Uh, and I apologize uh, for that. He's, he's very affectionate. Right, let's, um, let's start. So what can women, with all their 
extraordinary intuition, compassion, strength and leadership bring to the world in times of crisis. I want to introduce you to our moderators around the world now who will explain uh, what, uh, well, who is sitting on their panels uh, and indeed who they are. We're gonna end with Elizabeth who's here in London, but let's uh, start in another area of London. We can go to Max Pescatori, a CEO of the Montessori Center International. Max. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, it's very, <laughs> very, very good to see you. Very pleased to be here. Um, on the panel here in London, we have Traman Nguyen, who's founder and CEO of the Centre for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship. We have Ruth Hall, who's the CEO at Plessy Brennan, the National Outdoor Centre. Rachel Boyle, who is Head of Interdisciplinary Studies at Lise Beckett University. Shinara Edgehill Peart, founder and directress at Peart's Montessori. I'm Preeti Patel, Head of Education here at Montessori Centre International. Fantastic. Uh, look forward to hearing from you uh, in a few minutes' time. Let's go to, well, let's go to Lagos and speak to Rwande uh, Sadiko, uh, Chief Executive of uh, Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. Let's uh, hope we can see you. Yuwande, can you see and hear us? Good afternoon, all. So we have three fabulous speakers in Nigeria. I'm actually based in Abuja, the three of them are in Lagos. But we have Amanda Obidike, who is a multi-award winning social innovator, technologist, and data scientist. She's a strategy lead of STEMI Markers Africa. We have Hajara Abdul Fattah, who's the founder of Girl in STEM Initiative. She's a petroleum and gas engineer by profession, but her interests lie at the intersection of energy, environmental sustainability, and low carbon future. Then we have Blessing Akpan, who's the founder of the Innovative Child Network. Blessing is an educator and social entrepreneur. She's actually an undergraduate in university, and it is amazing that she, in the meantime, has created a platform that enables skill-based learning opportunity for the next generation, even though she's part of, in my view, the next generation, but she's created a platform for the next generation of innovative thinkers and creators. So I look forward to a very engaging conversation. Thank you. Well, Over thank to you. you. Thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you at the end of the discussion. Let's go to Nairobi, uh, Chilande Kuloba Waria. Uh, who's the Managing Director of the Walande Advisory Centre. Hello and welcome. Hello, team. Hello, everyone. This is Chilande from Nairobi. We are thrilled and indeed honoured to be a part of the third global conversation. My panellists today have overcome past pains and frustrations and built themselves up to where they are now leaving a legacy of creating sustainable second chances for women and girls in Kenya as they transition and integrate back into society after being in prison or juvenile detention. My panelists include Teresa Njoroge, the passionate and visionary CEO and founder of Clean Start Kenya. Susan Kihara, the, who's the chief operating officer for Clean Start. Cyprin Omolo, who heads up the coalition of formerly imprisoned women um, and also heads up the internal services at Clean Start. We also have Sarah Odima, who assists in implementing the Circles of Healing program at, at Clean Start. Beatrice Waihura Waithaka, who plays, uh, who contributes as a mentor for formerly imprisoned women in Kenya, and is herself an entrepreneur who runs a small business venture in the form of um, Sweet Link uh, Bakery. Then we also have Jane Ouma, who heads up the Tables of Support program and ensures that post imprisonment, the women are economically empowered to rebuild themselves. I look forward to a fantastic conversation and we shall get back with you again, Tim, um, yeah, I, after I the look conversation. Forward, look, look forward to hearing some of the uh, conclusions from that uh, panel. Uh, I think we can go to Beirut now, Miriam Spear. Hello everyone, joining you live from Beirut from the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. So we started off with a welcome word from our executive director, Lina Abirafe, and I have with me here Mia Atwe, who is the co-founder of Embrace Lebanon, a grassroots NGO raising awareness on mental health in Lebanon, which, which launched the first national suicide prevention hotline in the MENA in 2017. I have with me Amani Baini, a feminist legal researcher and political human rights and environmentalist activist. 
She's a champion of sustainability and the co-founder of Save the Bistry Valley campaign. I have also with me Yuna Makhlouf, a lawyer, researcher, and a member of the General Assembly of the Legal Agenda. Her publications and research focus on gender, identity, nationality, family, and personal status and religious laws. I also have Carol Mansour, prize-winning Lebanese documentary filmmaker. She founded Forward Film Production in 2000 in Beirut, Lebanon. With over 25 years of documentary production, Mansour achieved international recognition and honor for her films with over 50 films, festival screenings, and official selection worldwide. Her most recent film had to do with the Beirut Blast. And last but not least, I have Janam Elid, a renowned journalist and documentary producer and director, who in 2017, along with two other co-founders, launched Darash.com Media, an independent platform that addresses controversial issues that are underreported in the Arab region. She's also a feminist, an activist, and member of the Coalition to Defend Freedom of Expression in Lebanon, and has received countless awards for their, her groundbreaking work at Darash.com. Amazing, amazing. So I will stop here, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much indeed, Miriam. Can we go back to Zagreb? I know you can hear me. Um, we're just trying to sort out camera issue. So um, if I, Tim, what I'm gonna suggest I do is I just can start introducing my panel. Do that, even, yep. Even if we just can't get the camera. Um, and we will hopefully have got the camera set up and running by the time I, I finish. So first of all, welcome. Um, to everyone. Um, it's so fantastic to be a part of this. As um, we know, this is the first time that we've had a panel in Zagreb. So I have a fantastic group of women around the table. Um, and unfortunately, um, you can't see them, but they are a fantastic group of women around the table. So um, I'm going to just sort of start um, to my right. We have Stephanie Topkoff, who is the Executive Director of Intech Ventures. We have Victoria Zinchuk, who's head of creator of EBRD. We have Ivana, Ivana, sorry, Gazic, who is CEO of the Zagreb Stock Exchange. Um, we have Katerina Keto, who's audit partner at KPMG Croatia. And we have Mariana Zarolic Robic, who's president of PWNN Zagreb. So apologies that you didn't get to see us, but um, at least you know that we have a fantastic panel. Well, we, we saw it, we saw you a little earlier. Uh, well, and that's okay then. <laughs> I'm just hoping I'm hoping we can return to that because it was lovely seeing so many of you together, albeit uh, socially distancing and, and, and masked up. And let's go to Karachi. Let's go to Ambassador Tia Mahmoud. There we go. Oh, fantastic. Hello. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hello and salams from Pakistan. This is Atiyah Mahmood from Karachi. I'm delighted to be part of the third global conversation. And my panelists today are all outstanding women who have a long time commitment in promoting women empowerment. I have Dr. Sanya Nishtar just been elected a senator as well. She's a special assistant to the prime minister and a federal minister for poverty alleviation and social safety ministry. She's also the founder of Ahsas, a program for financial and digital inclusion of women through cash disbursements. She also appeared in BBC's list of 100 influential women of 2020. Then we have Farhat Asif. She's founder of the Institute of Peace and Div Diplomatic Studies, a think and do tank. She has also launched a global women insight, a digital live conversation for spotlighting women who have contributed to the development of the world around them. We have Maria Umar, founder and president of Women's Digital League since 2009, an online platform that provides digital training to women. Maria was also nominated a thought leader by Ashoka Changemakers. We have Ayla Raza, director of All Pakistan Music Conference. She works tirelessly to ensure sustenance to practitioners of classical music, and not only through performances, but also provision of financial help whenever needed. She has been doing so for over 17 years now. Abdiya Shaheen Qadriya is the program manager at Depilex Smile Again Foundation, which provides support and training to burn victims. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. All right. Uh, another fascinating panel there. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I've just been told that Bayan uh, has now unmuted. So, Bayan, can we go back to you now and Aman? 
Hello, Flam Amman. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. I'm Bayana Tal, Senior Advisor at the Jordan Media Institute. My amazing panelists are Khulud Saqaf, CEO of Social Security Investment Fund, a lot of money. Dr. Salman Nim, Secretary General of the Jordanian National Commission for Women, quite an activist. Muna Sukhtian, Managing Director of Microfund for Women, another one. And a young panelist, Luma Al Adnani, founder of a startup called Adam Mishmish, an educational cartoon for ages zero to five. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Lovely to finally get you. I'm going to introduce, well, I'm going to go back to Elizabeth now to introduce her panel. But what I'm going to say is that after Elizabeth has introduced her panel, I suggest uh, everyone gets going uh, and we'll then we can revert in about 45 minutes time. Elizabeth, uh, back to you though now. Thank you very much, Tim. And actually, I would like to thank everyone uh, because it is a collaborative work and uh, it's our speakers, our partners around the world from all these different cities that make it happen every year. This is our third global conversation and I do hope that the fourth one in 2022 will have some normalcy and we will be able to be in the same room as, as uh, at least they are in Zagreb. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us and time to introduce my panel here. Uh, first, I'll go with uh, go to Oman and Her Highness Basma Al Said, who is the founder and CEO of the Whispers of Serenity. Hello, Basma. Can we see you? Can you hear me? Please switch yes, your camera. I can. Scarf. <laughs> yes, we Hi. can see the full scarf. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, good afternoon to all of you. This is really overwhelmingly happy. Lots of people from everywhere, amazing. Yes, thank you. Well, we plan to have a meaningful conversation and connect leading women from around the world. So I'll do first you know, some introductions uh, for the panelists. Uh, let's go now to the US. Marjorie Krauss, founder and president of APCO Worldwide. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to meet all these fantastic women. I think the last time and we were in the same room together, it was in Jordan, probably. It was, a long time ago. <laughs> time Great. to catch up. Uh, and then let's go to London. So not far from where I am, Amber Gadar, the founder of uh, Alliance Block, a blockchain pioneer. Hello, everyone. Elizabeth, lovely to see you. And lovely to see everyone. Basma, good to see you. It's been a long time. Me too. <laughs> And now let's go to Africa and Zimbabwe, where Tsitsi Mutendi, she's the founder of African Family Firms and joining us. Hello, Tsitsi. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm very well. Nice to see Lovely you. To be here. Nice Lovely to have to everyone be here. on this conversation. And finally, let us go to Lebanon again. And this time we are seeing May Chidiak, the founder and president of May Chidiak Foundation and a very well-known broadcaster and journalist and former minister, of course. Can you hear me, May? Yes, I hear you. I can hear you. And uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I'm uh, so happy to take part in uh, this panel and in this whole forum, gathering women from all over the world. Uh, I congratulate you for uh, this success uh, to have all of us at the same time in the same room, even virtually. Well, as I said before, this is something that takes, you know, the commitment and passion of many people in order to, you know, happen. And so I'm grateful to everyone who's joining us. And of course, the remarkable men who are supporting this effort, Tim Wilcox, Doug, Doug Wills, and the many other speakers, male speakers who are joining us around the world. So, Tim, what am I doing next? Uh, you are going to start your panel discussion and everyone else is going to uh, start their discussion now as well. And then in about 45 minutes time, uh, as I understand it, uh, you're going to send some conclusions back, um, which we can read out, you and I together, and maybe with Sophie's help as well, in case I lose my way in this, uh, in this virtual world. Uh, and uh, then we'll have some Q and A's. Fantastic. So every city now can go ahead with a local conversation, and then we are convening in 45 minutes, to hear what the main conclusions, the main points from every city are going to be. 
and then we will conclude with the final, I think, 25 minute live Q&A, people who are joining us and they will be able to raise and, questions. And does everyone know how to um, uh, send their questions in? There's a Q&A area, that is a very good point, Tim. Okay, maybe Sophie can help us. Why, why don't we start the discussions and then, uh, then I can try and figure out the, the Q&As. In the bottom of the page. That would be super. All okay. right then, so ready to begin. Can I ask uh, uh, for everyone else outside of the London panel to switch their cameras off? And uh, ladies, so Marjorie, I'm going to start from you. The overall theme of that conversation or of that day okay. really, um, is we are let's um... use the challenge. Uh, Marjorie, I want to challenge you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it's the, it's the day to challenge each challenge other. Challenge accepted prejudices and uh, bias. So uh, I want us, you know, we know your title and we know your achievements and you have built a company from a small agency to an 800 people company that, that reaches 30 markets, if not more, within a period of, what was it, 37 years. But what I would like to hear from you and actually all our panelists is a personal statement or even a personal story that has defined you as an individual. This is how I would like you to introduce yourself. That is a challenge. Okay, well, for me, um, I'm a child of immigrants. I'm first generation in America. So I came, uh, I was born uh, with parents who really um, were just learning the country and um, had a small business. My father had a, a small store in a small town. And so I think we all learned uh, the, the importance of uh, two things. One is um, work and uh, ambition and a uh, good ambition. And the second was uh, because the town was only 3000 people, the power of relationships. Um, my father lent credit to people who couldn't afford things from the time I could remember just on a shake, handshake or a signature. Mm -hmm. And I think that really defined my life um, to be uh, the combination of uh, doing good things and purpose along with um, some entrepreneurial spirit to, um, to bring things of value to people. And, um, and so I think those are the, probably the two things that um, define me the most. I, I also um, was trained as a civics teacher. So I learned to find my voice, um, but it was quite interesting because I was only, I never um, uh, had an official degree for undergrad for high school. So I went to college very early. I was only two years older than my students. Um, so I also had to learn to um, maybe act in a more mature way for my age than would be required normally just because of, of the job. And I think this teaching has stayed with me throughout my life. And I still see myself as a teacher, both for our clients and for staff. And the only other thing I'd say is, um, my company um, is now, you know, quite large. Um, it's actually when we all in over almost a thousand people. And um, we have very equal balance between men and women, both in leadership and throughout the ranks. And we uh, are the largest majority women owned firm in our field. So I personally feel extra responsibility for that. I hope that wasn't too long, but that's kind of the essence of who I am, I guess. That was fascinating and thank you because it is about sharing the more personal story, which is, uh, you know, what we learn from and get inspired by. And with this, I would like to go to May, May Chidiak in Lebanon, uh, who also has a very powerful story to share. You have a career that spans politics, media, um, civil society. Uh, you are an activist. And uh, when was it? 26 years ago, there was this horrific attack against your life, May. 16. And, uh, <laughs> it brought you as close to death as, as yes. anyone could get. So, so tell us, what is it that has created the May that we have here in front of us today? In fact, uh, this is a life story. I'm uh, a veteran uh, Lebanese TV anchor and journalist uh, with a career spanning over uh, 25 years. I was the target of an assassination attempt by the Syrian regime and its allies. Uh, Syrian regime was occupying my country for 30 years. As a result of the attack, I lost my left 
arm and left leg. And uh, I had to go under, to undergo more than 40 surgeries. In fact, they put explosives under the seat of my car and they waited uh, for me. Uh, when I got into the car, they pressed the button and cut me into pieces. But uh, still uh, with the two amputed limbs and uh, two prosthesis, I uh, pursued my career uh, 10 uh, months after uh, the killing attempt, I was back on air with two prosthetic hand and leg. In 2008, I uh, got my PhD. I continued my studies even after the assassination attempt. And now I teach at uh, Notre Dame University in uh, science of information and communication. Uh, years uh, after uh, I was named uh, as the Minister of State uh, for Administrative Reform in 2019 Lebanese Cabinet under Prime Minister Saad Al Hariri. Uh, as you previously mentioned, uh, I'm uh, the founder and president of the Media Foundation Media Institute uh, that is aimed uh, at promoting freedom of speech, media freedom, democracy, and uh, social welfare, and uh, human rights, and especially women's rights. My life and career have been filled with turbulence and unforgiving uh, years because my life's work and purpose have always been absolutely interwined with the state of my beloved country, Lebanon, whether in the wake of oppression, tyranny, and fundamentalism. I can only say that despite the difficult challenges, especially following the uh, 17 October 2019 movement uh, and the Beirut uh, port explosion that took place on August 4, uh, 2020 and destroyed my city, I still like, cling to my country's resilient nature and its people's limitless strength. Thank you. And the incredible courage of Lebanese women and of course men. I mean, it's uh, it's the, this resilience and this courage that keeps you going and rebuilding a country which is so beautiful and has, you know, you're blessed with amazing people, talent. And uh, yes, how everyone's heart broke last summer. Yeah. Right. We'll come back yeah. to that. Let me go now to Oman and Her Highness Basma Al Said. Basma, you are a mental health activist and you had to go through quite a few challenges until you got to the point of launching the, the Whispers of Serenity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, there wasn't much challenges, thank God, because um, it was new, nobody had done it before and it was much needed. So it was, if anything, it was me challenging myself, not any external challenges. And I think in everything, it's about you it's about you challenging yourself, then being able to deal with um, other challenges. A lot of people think because it's mental health, then it's gonna be very difficult. People are not gonna accept it. And yes, there is a part of it that's always gonna stay like that because it, there is a part that's a taboo, mm -hmm. but um, it's changed all over the world. And I think it's sad in a way, but good. It took COVID to make people understand, wake up, mental health is very important. So having uh, saying that the taboo will end it will not end completely but it's much much better than before and i think it won't be zero effect taboo because it's very very personal we just had two stories and both stories have a psychological effect so psych is everywhere and it will always be everywhere and because of what we're going through now i think um, it's in a weird way a blessing because now people have the big magnifying glass and thinking, wait a minute, we've forgotten two very important things that people kept on talking about, women in leadership and mental health. Well, I will take this opportunity to actually announce that today uh, I'm launching my book From Women to the World. And this is a big milestone uh, for me, but also for the work that we have been doing as Athena 40. And From Women to the World is really uh, letters written by exceptional maverick women from around the world who share their stories, stories of, of pain, but also stories of achievements and successes. And, and Basma is one of our contributors. So this is why I asked you about challenges because in your letter, you are talking and referring to some challenges that you had on a personal level until you were able to decide what you wanted to do in life, which was support and introduce mental health uh, therapy in Oman, yeah. but also how you had to convince 
your family to kind of, you know, allow you to chase your dream? Well, the letter is a bit, it's, a, it's, it's another twist. It wasn't that fully, but uh, yes, in the beginning, I, uh, my father told me I should study something, but then he, he accepted it. it wasn't, that wasn't the challenge. The challenge in the end from that letter, and I hope you, we all read it later on, was me, was my challenge, was me accepting me for who I am. So yes, that's all the point. Very important, very important point. And yes. Thank you, Kashma. And you. let's go now to Africa and Zimbabwe. Siti, hello there. Hi there. So what is a story? How would you describe yourself? And what is a story that has defined you? I would describe myself as a woman that was born um, in a very interesting continent that has got um, a lot of push and pull that happens. But the most defining moment for me was when I had just gotten married and I was expecting my first child and I experienced the maternal mortality that happens on the continent that is not spoken about by a lot of people. And um, I lost my first child nine months into my pregnancy. And that experience, that event changed my life. It changed the way I saw the world. It changed the way I wanted to contribute to the world. It led me to my journey where I set up a publishing company that now goes forth and tells stories from across the continent. Um, stories from women, from men, and it allows us to, to share our experiences in our most authentic selves. I also went on to then have three children and start a school because I wanted to be able to invest in the future, to invest in the future doctors, the future leaders, the future of our continent. And I continue to do that work through African family firms, because now not only am I investing in the future, I'm creating spaces through family businesses and helping them create an economic future for the continent. So I think that one pivotal event when I realized that through your pain, you can get through it and use that pain in a positive way to help others. I, I gained strength and I gained a voice that I probably would have never had. Thank you. And over the last year at City, I think the world has experienced a lot of pain and losses and death and that threat against our well-being in a way that we'd never perhaps had expected. So uh, loss is definitely something that defines us and defines our choices in life and also uh, our mission. And with this, let me go to Amber to ask her to introduce herself. One of the quotes that uh, had impressed me, uh, Amber, and you are, of course, a tech pioneer, I, I said that in the beginning, is uh, you had said that we should say to mothers not to call their, their daughters princesses, but actually to call them empresses and queens. And so empower them with, you know, the use of words that actually mean something which has serious decision making power. That's correct. That's correct. First, I want to take the occasion to uh, uh, extend my salutes to May, May Shidiak. My father is of Lebanese descent, and uh, she is one of the women in Lebanon. So it's an honor, to, an honor to, to, to meet her. And uh, indeed, so my parents, everything I am is because of my parents, because they taught me that the sky is the limit. You can be whatever you want and you can reach any any limit you want if you if you work for it even though it's not it's not really true you always need some help right um so i i studied sciences for the initial part of of my life i have a phd in molecular medicine and my focus was on uh, nanotechnologies and, and neurosciences and then i decided to start a company and this is why i went to business school and from business school i started my career in finance uh, at goldman sachs and then at jp morgan where i stayed for uh, roughly eight years and in 2018 i uh, decided to finally go solo with the two friends of mine to start alliance buck and I believe, uh, Elizabeth, you saw me at the beginning of the company when we were still struggling and still crying and still, you know, it was very, very painful. Um, but yeah, with, uh, with hard work, 
Today, uh, the company is worth $80 million in, in two years time. We're doing, we're doing really, really well. And we're very lucky that as women, this generation is our generation. We have never had uh, as much light and as much power that we have now. And it's a great occasion for us to just step up and, and go get what we want to get. Thank you, Amber. Well, I have a series of questions here, but I'd really like to pick up on the point that you just made, that today women have the most power than we've ever had in history. And I would like to begin with Marjorie. Do you agree with that point, Marjorie? I do. I, I think we have a long way to go, but I, you know, I've been, I'm probably the oldest one on the panel. So I've been at this a long time. And the difference from my first job where I had to lie about being pregnant so I wouldn't lose my job to today is, is very different. And um, I still see a lot of places where there should be more opportunity for women, but um, I, you know, I think we've come a long way. And I, I sent you a note, if anybody's interested, I, I wrote a book last year um, trying to help uh, younger women who are having families um, realize that they learn a lot from being parents that also feed into this, um, you know, and it's, it's called Roots and Wings. It's 10 things I learned from motherhood that helped me build my business because I wanted women to feel free that you don't make these choices, that to be a whole person, um, you know, you can, you can do both. And so I'm happy to make copies available free to anybody who wants them. So um, just let me know. Thank you. We'll definitely take you up on that. Uh, I'd love to read your book. You know, the reason why we built uh, Athena 40 is precisely because we want to connect stories and we want to hear what is happening in different parts of the world. And I will agree with the point that Amber made that yes, today uh, things are much better for women but for many reasons. On top of, of um, those many reasons is the fact that we are now more organized and we create movements that generate change for each other. And that is something very important. On the other hand, it is not a generic situation things in Lebanon or in Jordan or in Pakistan are very different to the reality in the UK uh, or in the, in the US. And as I mentioned, if, if uh, you saw my introduction today, I said that we are still, as women, underrepresented and undervalued. And this is something that figures, you know, data, evidence. And so I would like us to always, you know, keep remembering that there are two sides uh, on this one. Yes, we are doing things, we are advancing, we are progressing, but the road ahead is still very long. I mean, to achieve gender equality on a political level, for example, we are going to need 130 years because it is only, let me check my, my data, I have some notes here. Uh, it is only in 22 countries that women serve as heads of state or government 119 countries around the world have never had a woman leader. And so at this rate, it's going to need about 130 years until we get to our 50, yes. 50 So May, do you have a point to make here? Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, there is a long, very long way to go, especially in countries like uh, Ours, unfortunately, they consider us as part of the uh, third world. And unfortunately, this is not what we used to be, but things uh, are changing to the worse. Uh, uh, but uh, mainly we can say that uh, we have stood out uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, in Lebanon in a good way. And even in many other uh, countries, uh, 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 women uh, showed that they were able uh, to uh, take over the situation and control it in a very good way, sometimes better uh, than men. And uh, this is a good point that was in favor of uh, women's uh, role, because the women are known for um, uh, their empathy, their collaboration, and their communication. So um, uh, most women leaders today have those characteristics uh, by the bulk, but uh, I do not personally subscribe to such uh, lionized uh, studies because the last thing women need is to be held by an even 
higher uh, standard, uh, some would say an unreachable pedestal with a limited room of error, for error. So um, maybe uh, we can say that it's, uh, isn't it enough that we must overcome barriers to prove ourselves in our societies, especially in developing countries, where even success is critiqued without the added pressure of not making any mistake during a crisis while also being nicer and more sensitive. So uh, we have always, as women, a double task. Mm -hmm. uh, we must uh, stay ourselves and uh, at the same time uh, work as leaders to overcome uh, the obstacles, especially in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you, May. Uh, Titi, what's the situation in Africa? Africa has been, I think so far we have been very lucky in terms of um, the spread of the COVID virus on the continent. We have managed to, to weather it. And um, although we haven't been as fortunate as um, other countries to have female leaders, we have um, been able within our own communities in spaces where women have been leaders to take um, the leadership stance as women. And I think the reason why countries that have had women leaders uh, or have uh, organizations that have had women at the forefront have um, done so well is because from a young age as women, we, we handle what's in front of us. We don't fantasize about what could be or what should be, but we handle what's in front of us us and we look uh, with a vision to a future that everybody is in it and is thriving so in in such a situation where COVID hit us you find that that's the same stance we've taken I've seen so many organizations that have been led by women who have managed to look deeper into what service or what product that they actually offer and being able to stay afloat and um, keep employees at work and they've been managed to look towards what the future may look like after COVID and also looking at the reality that's in front of us and being able to handle it as it is or not as what we would wish it to be. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, thank you Titi, if you're familiar with that study which was conducted a few months ago by two professors of the University of Liverpool and the University of Reading. And, and so the conclusion was after they've studied the situation in 194 countries, um, of which 19 have been governed by women, if I'm not mistaken, do not quote me on that one, but we can check, that it's been very much the fact that in countries led, led by women and to some extent, um, the situation of being or faring better during COVID is because of their proactive policy responses, and that was primarily adopted by women leaders. What are your thoughts here, Basma? So um, it's interesting. Um, as you said, there's two sides to the story. Some countries have advanced in that and have more women leaders, and some countries have stayed the same for whatever reason that is. Um, I do believe that women leaders have more strength because as women, we use both lobes of our brain. We have the, you know, the empathy, the love and all of that kind of emotion, mushy grishy thing. And then we have that thinking brain and to have both of them in one person, I think that's a big, big blessing. Um, here in Oman, we've actually um, experienced that recently as well. So we've had women um, uh, ambassadors, ministers, all of that. Uh, but recently we've had, we have actually uh, the first lady, which we didn't have for such a long time because our past Sultan didn't have a wife, but his mother was active and having her. And this is when I hear when people say empowerment, I used to say, we've always been empowered since we were born. I think we've been empowered women, I believe we're empowered, but seeing her now do things and being active and out there, you feel very proud and you feel, yes, you do it. You show them and we're behind you, you know, we'll, we'll stand by you. And we didn't have that feeling for the longest time. So it's very interesting how to see how 
the men are reacting to it in a different way completely to the women and some women also bless them sometimes they're quite difficult and they're finding it difficult to think that there is a woman now that's actually leading us they were happy with having lots of other women not just one which is quite interesting so I believe that having a woman leader adds so much things. It adds the softness, yes, it, uh, yet it adds the toughness. It adds the passion into being a mother and seeing all the children and at the same time taking, you know, uh, we have to do one, two and three. So you see two sides of a story in one person. And I do believe that women have become stronger, but saying that the new generation, the younger generation have become a bit too sensitive, I feel. I don't know if this is this side of the world or all over, but young, what, what young. Do you mean when you say they have become yeah. a bit too sensitive, I'd like to. No, they are them. sensitive. They have, they are very sensitive. Yes, yes, so yes. I, I, I notice now with the with my practice when I see cases and with with the young nieces and all of them they're very defensive so in a time where we would be like we can do it and we can we're the movers and shakers of the world and we can take any hardship there like we can do it then one two three then they break down it's like no you guys are not listening we're gonna end our life they collapse very fast they don't they don't have that strength and this is a something that I even talked about today I'm worrying about them in the future you know, when they start working and when they start living all these things and, and all these things that are happening around the world, they need to understand it's not only about you. So the new generation are amazing when they believe in something, but from what I see and from some studies that we have done, they're a bit sensitive. They're very defensive. And these two things are very worrying. It's okay to be sensitive, it's beautiful, but when sensitivity takes you to a level where you can't think and you shut down, that is not that is not a good thing. So that's worrying me now with women of today. A very uh, interesting finding. Uh, Amber. Yeah, excellence uh, here, Elizabeth. I would say that uh, maybe uh, allow me to uh, add one uh, thing uh, on this. Maybe they are so sensitive or weak, they don't want to take challenges because uh, there is stability in your country. Maybe mm -hmm. when you go to other countries where you have continuous challenges all over the year, every day and day, you don't know what to expect. So uh, this is a luxury that you don't have. Uh, this is why sometimes it's uh, challenging to have uh, maybe some problems uh, that you, uh, uh, you need to solve uh, to uh, see women uh, trying to prove themselves and becoming more uh, powerful. Yeah. But this is something also um, internationally um, as women, and yes, I can't, I can't compete with what's going on in Lebanon at all, but they're not like you. You're amazing. You went through, I mean, you went through a whole blast and you came back. It's very, it's, they're amazing. They're very um, forthcoming and everything, but they give up faster. They, they're angry. The, well, the ang sensitivity brings anger. It doesn't God bring, God. and it's a different type of anger. There's anger that moves you forward and there's anger that paralyzes you and makes you not yes. think. So it's a very different one. It's very interesting, and I would like to hear from a woman who never gives up. And the, I mean, all of us, I think, in that conversation and all the women around the world who are joining us, they do not know what the word give up means. And I'm certain about that. But Amber, you talked to us before about your you know, perseverance and persistence until you got to the point after, yes, many difficulties and, and uh, challenges you've had on the way to get your company to where it is today after two years. But what is it that made you, you know, not being defensive, not giving up, being there and standing for what you believed in? And younger than Amber, yeah, what I'm talking about, just to keep it there. <laughs> I, I, would, I would agree with that in some way. And this goes back to what I was talking about, about, you know, the princess philosophy versus the empress and queen philosophy. Like we're living in a world where, you know, social media is everywhere. You are being praised constantly for being, for being pretty, for, for being a woman, for being, I mean, it's, 
it, it blows the, the head of, of, uh, of young girls. So this is why education and parents are very important. It's very important for women now to understand that they don't have a passive role anymore. They need to step up and have this active role. They need to be queens. They need to be builders. They need to be leaders, not just followers. And But going back, just a, a step a step backward on on um, on leadership and the difference between women and men i mean you know what women are best in time of crisis because our life is a crisis from the moment we start having our periods every month we live a crisis when we're pregnant we have a human being eating our bones our whole life is a crisis this is why we're very good at, at managing crisis and you know, a little deeper now, let's jump into the, the, the psychology of it. You have the feminine and the masculine in leadership, right? You can be a male and have like a feminine tendency and you could be a female and have a masculine tendencies. So this is what I call like the circular versus the pyramidal uh, style of leadership. So when, when you are, a, well, most women have the circular type of leadership which is more transformational, more cooperative, and has a preference for flat structures. And most male have what I call the pyramidal, um, uh, the pyramidal style, wh where they are more competitive, uh, more aggressive, and prefer hierarchical type of infrastructure um, uh, structures. But now what we're seeing is, and this is due to tech and due, due to all of the disruptive revolutions that we have since internet and mobile communication and today with blockchain and AI, etc., the world is flattening, right? We are becoming a circular economy. We are become, becoming a collective economy. And this is when women have the, uh, um, the opportunity to stand up and show that their leadership style is actually very good as well. And this is where I, I see things going. I mean, you can see more and more women CEOs. We've seen uh, the new uh, uh, Citibank uh, CEO. It's a woman. We've seen, I can't remember her name, bless me, um, the founder of Bumble uh, who just uh, IPO'd her company. She's the youngest female billionaire ever. And she used to be on the Tinder, uh, on the Tinder co-founding team, got into a big fight with her co-founder and then decided to leave and build her own company. So there are a lot of opportunities. And our style of leadership is what is going to move forward. Elizabeth, can I just throw something into this mix because it is International Women's Day. I think um, I agree that women in times of crisis and you know, I think it's the combination of know-how and empathy, but I think we should also just pay attention and especially as the world is going more digital and AI and technical. Um, the, the worst group impacted by COVID around the world was women. By far, the impact, not just in job loss um, and in, in disease and in having to bear the responsibility for balancing, taking care of family with trying to put food on the table. A lot of women took a step backward. We have a duty um, since we're all kind of high achieving women on this call to do something to help bring these other women along. Oh, we're gonna lose a whole generation of time of women who, um, who, who are, are uh, facing difficulties not of their own making. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to um, infuse that in the conversation because while we've seen women perform at the very top in ways that really exceeded the men in terms of how these countries were managed, um, I think we also um, have to be very um, sensitive about the women who did not. Mm -hmm. And then one other thing I was just gonna say, I think one re reason, Basma, that you see these women, I, what I see is that younger women also, um, I see that I have uh, nine grandchildren, six are women. Oh. And as they're coming of age, <laughs> they're working now. Some of them are already out of college, one. And, um, but there is a sense of entitlement that comes from not having to have struggled in the same way that maybe a previous generation did. And so, you know, it wasn't until in this past administration in the US when, you know, we came, we're, we came very close, we still might, you know, the, the right to choose, the right to be responsible for yourself could go away, that women started to realize that maybe all these things aren't God-given rights that people really fought for them. 
Um, so I hope we don't lose that spirit of a fight um, going forward. So uh, sorry, Marjorie, you, no, no, no. I was, I was, uh, I wanted to ask you about some of the prejudice and bias that you experienced when you started uh -huh. the agency. <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> um, there are so many stories. Some but, headlines. <laughs> there, I mean, you know, um, so I'm 74. So just to give you a time uh, perspective. Um, so I, every kind, I mean, you know, uh, from find, finding financing, I had to bootstrap my, my company uh, step by step, which is went from one person now to almost a thousand, but it took a long time. Um, I think that uh, whether people, you know, you just had to be better, um, whether people took you seriously, whether, um, you know, that the, the, um, the, I have to give a lot of credit to the men who work in the company because a lot of them are even former government officials and they're people who really do respect and do advance women. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we've built, we're building a culture where um, there's more support for this, but um, I can, I've had very funny stories and I've had, um, I've had ministers tell me they never met with a president except in their bedroom. I mean, through interpreters, <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, it's the typical thing that you, that you hear and you just have to learn to deal with it. But one of the best lessons out of all of that, and I give this lesson to everybody, um, is the saying to, to never underestimate the power of being underestimated. And I think what I tried to do was to take every one of these negative things and make it a positive thing for, for uh, advancing what I was doing. Thank you. And I see Tim, who has just joined us. Is it to ask a question, make a comment, or to link us to other cities? You know, it was, I've been listening to the entire conversation. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I think it's about time, isn't it, to um, hook up if we're going to try and stick to the schedule? Um, yes, and then we can continue with the conversation and the Q&A because we have many live questions from our audience and we can continue after we link with uh, the, uh, our cities. And Yawande has already joined, I see, but uh, is, are you on mute, Yawande? Yes, Nigeria is back. <laughs> Hello, Nigeria. <laughs> Nigeria has never left, I thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I never left. I just put it on mute, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, look, should we start with you, um, Yawande? How, how did it go? So we had three panelists. Unfortunately, we lost one for a variety of reasons she was not able to join, but we had a very engaging conversation anyway. Um, so we started off with the nerve that the ladies had. Ordinarily, they should aspire, sorry, I hope you can hear me well. So did you say nerve? The nerve, yes. The nerve, yeah. We started off with the nerve that they had. Yeah. Ordinarily, people would expect you in Nigeria as a woman to aspire, they would expect a man to aspire to be astronaut, engineer, surgeon, doctor, and a woman is supposed to aspire to be female astronaut, female engineer, female surgeon, or a female doctor. But these are ladies that aspire to be engineer, period, data scientist, period, and the things that they learned from that journey. But it was also from both of them, the importance of empathy, in particular in dealing with crisis. And both seemed to assume that it is built into every woman's DNA. Yeah. Um, but our empathy, but the, one of the biggest yeah. things that empathy leaves you with is the ability to assure people that it will be all right, even where there are challenges. And the fact that they believe that it is possible actually helps them to work towards a solution that is possible. There was a phrase that one of them used that I particularly liked, and it was about the moral of intentionality that in the context of what women can do, there's this concept of a bias. The bias is unconscious, but it is in all of us, male and female. To deal with it, we actually all need to learn the moral of intentionality. And I, and I really like that, um, that um, expression. 
But without a doubt, what the world has shown at this time of crisis in New Zealand, in Finland, in Iceland, in Germany, is that women have been able to deal with the crisis better. And you know, we generally think a good part of it boils down to empathy, emotional intelligence, and the ability to give people hope about what is possible. I'll stop there. Thank you. That, that's really interesting because, and I was only able to listen to the, the London panel, one of the London panels, but uh, exactly those words came up, empathy, uh, and also this idea of, of uh, empathy and, uh, and hard work and dealing with crisis built into every woman's DNA, which, which, is, uh, which is interesting. But I'm, uh, let's see what other people have been saying. Can I just go randomly? So Ambassador Tia. Thank you, thank you so much. We had a very, very good discussion in Karachi. Uh, and uh, the general thrust of the discussion was that women have a very different way of building partnerships and forging collaborations. The management of human resource, risk taking, and a workplace where these skills are combined with male competencies, the organization works better. Um, and this is not only restricted to the COVID context, but in all contexts, diversity and synergy of both genders at leadership positions is very important for any country. We faced challenges due to low digital and financial literacy um, at the time of COVID, but we created systems which have been working out very well. The government initiated certain programs uh, with di on digital uh, literacy, which, which actually enhanced the digital literacy of the uh, people and give, provided them sustenance during these times. It was also discussed that uh, leadership in politics, or women leadership in politics has to be given to workers at grassroots levels. Elitism in politics has to go. For, for in order that women come up to these leadership positions and make a difference. In, it was also agreed that empathy is extremely important and empathy, which really comes out at times of disasters, is, can be turned into positive energy and help people of different um, diversity, ethnicity, religion, anything. So it, has, it, it goes across barriers. We have discussed also the glass ceiling effect. We, we think that it, it, it is actually a, a more than a glass where we cannot see even women in different positions cannot see the women on the top. So there has to be more visibility of leaders, women leaders for the general masses, for them to see how well they are performing and how well they, the, the results are showing that. There are challenges for the next generation, but it was, it was uh, considered that the trauma that uh, women feel and have felt over the years should not be transferred to the younger generation of women coming to the fore and playing their role in leadership and at workplaces. They should not have the same trauma they should have more positivity and healthier models to follow. So post COVID, the workplace environment will have to change and involve more and more technology. And what it did to governments was that it made them mobile and agile, the COVID. So that needs to be incorporated in a normal work routines of governments as well as individuals. So I, I think uh, this is a, small gist of what was discussed. And and that's, that's really interesting. Did your panel think that the glass ceiling, which wasn't made of glass, uh, was particular to Pakistan? Did they think that this was a, this was a, a, a national problem in Pakistan? Yeah, it was, it was discussed that it is more of a concrete ceiling. It, it's, it could not be only specific to Pakistan. It can be anywhere else, I think, in the developing world, even in the developed world at times where the visibility of women in leadership, women who are really making a difference is not filtering through down to the lower levels. Uh, so that needs to change the, the visibility of women and women should not only be restricted to women 
uh, forums and panels and all, it should be gender neutral. There should be both genders who will discuss these issues so that the visibility increases and the leadership roles are also increased. Okay, no, really interesting. Let's, uh, should we just see if we can go back to Lionel Stepich? Okay, well, hello everyone. Can oh, everyone hear me? Lionel, put your camera on. So we're still having some camera issues, but um, hopefully you can still hear me. Well, we had a very interesting panel discussion and, and we almost started a new political party here in Croatia um, of <laughs> women by women. So, um, yeah, so let me. Um, let me tell you a little bit about kind of what we discussed. Um, I think we're still having camera issues, unfortunately. Uh, that's um, a shame, but we can, we can hear you very clearly. Good, okay. So we, we talked about um, that society needed to encourage um, women and need to create a safety net for us to be able to sort of expand, um, but also that it, that it was down to the individual and that personal development as well. Um, it was sort of a little bit depressing in that um, we, we're seeing a regression of women's roles, um, possibly, you know, uh, not just in, in terms of the pandemic, but even before. And, and um, what was the word you used? A, re a regression? Yes. So sort of there were there were in, you know, um, one of our panelists was saying that um, they're seeing um, uh, less women in senior leadership roles than they have, you know, done in previous ten years. So that was that was quite sort of depressing. Um, I think it was also recognised that it's quite difficult being a woman in the pandemic, um, not just from a perspective of employment, where I think it was sixty percent of women have lost their jobs compared to forty percent of men. But from a from a personal perspective, having to juggle um, homeschooling, having to juggle the, the caring um, activities that some women had, plus running you know their their lives and, and their businesses or their jobs, um, and you know women don't always feel that they can just switch off. So that was um, quite um, quite sad. Um, however, we did see on the positive side that um, you know the pandemic is an opportunity to change things it is an opportunity to reset there's a real passion for changing things at the moment and we thought that that was really sort of you know a time when we should actually grab that opportunity and I think that the phrase we should just go and do it um, was um, was said um, and that actually you know, this was seen after the last financial crisis of, of you know 2008, where often women were given the opportunity to come in senior leadership roles, although particularly to clean up rather than to actually do anything else. We talked about sort of last trip, um, where women you know get brought in to actually clean up the mess. Um, we talked about you know the emotion, um, personal biases. We have the prejudice that this isn't just men against women, but sometimes we have it within ourselves, and we have to question ourselves, and we should we should do that. And we also talked about the role of men. And it's really important that men have not just um, a place in this conversation and in the actions that need to be taken, but they have a responsibility. And that we should actually, you know, call on men to to step up to that responsibility. Um, we had a fantastic phrase where um, it was felt that in in some service, in some industries it was a bit of a boys' club. So the suggestion was that actually that um, women shouldn't worry about not being part of the boys' clubs because not much happens in these boys' clubs. They should actually set up their own clubs because there might be more things, more fun in conversations to be had. Um, and um, we felt that we shouldn't undervalue ourselves. I think uh, we should not undervalue our financial work and that women should do that. Um, and we should con just continue to achieve, just go out and do it, and, um, and don't be afraid of competition. All right, uh, we've got a few sound issues. I'm sorry, oh. I, I caught most of that. I hope everyone else did as well. Uh, let's go to um, Max in uh, London. Hello, Tim. Apologies. Um, That's fine. How, how, how did it go? Um, we, we're having a very rich and um, uh, wonderful conversation here um, in the UK. 
Um, I'll do my very best to summarise the main points that were raised and the course to actions that were right. Um, so main, uh, main points from our panel and our audience are, main points are, um, it's important to have role models from underrepresented groups. We're seeing more women leaders um, following the first female CEO or chair. Anyone can call themselves a leader. Leadership is a set of skills, understanding and mindset and developing leadership takes leadership work. So how do we access leadership development question? Uh, you need to know it exists, you need to be able to ask for it, and you need to have an adequate for it. And this goes for all underrepresented groups. It's important to adapt and readapt to the world, manage your mindset locally and around the world. We're living in a world of collaboration. It's about scalability and a global view. Turning to the pandemic has created an opportunity because this is testing the metal. Whether male or female, the most important thing is resilience and adapting in moments of crisis. Uh, going on, leadership needs self-knowledge. What takes you from pressure to stress? Question. Um, confidence in who you are. Um, what you see and um, what you see we can take, oh, sorry, and what you do to, so that we can take opportunities and bounce back and know that, that you can bounce back when there's a crisis and deal with that uncertainty and, and that relies on a set of skills that can't be taught in a classroom. There are greater pressure on brands to contribute beyond the bottom line, to contribute with strong authentic leaders and typically we see women as the more adaptable leader according to the recent Harvard Business Review report and even more so following the pandemic that went before it. So again working with integrity and honesty uh, etc. seem to be attributes uh, that are key. Um, in terms of uh, approach, Montessori principles are there's a cornerstone there of trust and as educators, um, our panelists are all from the education sector by the way, so as educators we have to focus on trust. Um, these are the skills that future generations will need. Academic achievements are needed but other uh, attributes are needed also. Um, we've had to be reactive and flexible some skills that we didn't know that we had. Our next generation need to understand that these skills are vital. And finally, Montessori provides safe spaces to have experience to learn from. So you need to lead, but with the opportunity to make mistakes, true at the nursery settings and it's true in leadership also. And then if I may, Tim, just um, three or four calls to action. If you're a female leader, leave the ladder down. Even better, help someone up the ladder behind you, first one. Second one, make it a priority to encourage, to empower, to nurture and support and give opportunities to women. Third one, um, there's a barrier stopping women becoming entrepreneurs. We need to understand why. And the last one, if we have a leadership development programme, we need to publicise it. Um, we don't necessarily need to link it to leadership to achieve in seniority and to be set targets for line managed to recommend leaders. Brilliant. That's from the UK Hamilton. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, and again, so many of these same themes coming up. Uh, I think we've got a few more. Uh, Nairobi, can we go to Chilande now? Hi, Tim. Good. Glad to be back. We are yeah, having a very... Glad to have you back as well. That, that, <laughs> we are having a very passionate conversation, um, which, you know, is still going on, actually. Uh, but we got, we've got an, a lot of good points already coming out. Um, I think there's a general consensus on the strength of a woman, um, and, as, and not just the strength of a woman, but especially in times of crisis. It is encouraged that, you know, um, that leaders should forge strategic alliances, strategic partnerships with women that allow them not only to make a difference, but also to empower others um, in, in, instead of constantly putting barriers in front of them that challenge them, we should look for ways in which we need to strengthen them. Uh, the support that is being called for um, is being looked at holistically, instead of the quick fixes that are, that are normally the characteristic of uh, support to uh, marginalized societies. We are saying we want support um, economically, socially, and physically. Um, 
There is also a recognition that women have this innate energy that all it requires is that small spark and it can really contribute very significantly to improving the societies around us and that people should not take you know, the strength of a woman uh, as a title for granted. Uh, we do need support to remain strong and actually make, um, make a contribution, a sustainable contribution uh, to the societies. There is also a very big call for increased partnership with governments um, and, and indeed lobbying efforts increased to promote women in leadership, in senior leadership uh, at that so that they can actually contribute in a meaningful way. We are looking at contributions that women can make to be not only for themselves, because these are those are strong recognition that the woman must be strong first and foremost before she can actually impact others, and that needs to be an area of emphasis moving forward. Uh, but we are also saying, other than strengthening themselves, there's also um, we need to create avenues to allow them to contribute to society and also at government and policy level, so that um, the contribution that women make is actually sustainable. Uh, th there was also quite, um, uh, you know, an appreciation for the fact that a, a lot of the women leaders that we look around us have been trained, have been, there's a strong foundation that's laid out for these women that allow them to look at, at around them at the resources available to them, use those resources to address the immediate challenges that we face. Um, and so some of the things that they were saying that, you know, that the team, even just the participants were, were, were agreeing on is that there's four key defining factors for leadership, women leadership. One is our ability, unique ability to build trust um, and build it in a strong way. Two is there's a lot of decisive action that women are now taking, which helps in times of crisis to act quick. Um, of course, leveraging available resources means that a lot of women leaders that we've looked at have utilized technology to address the issues that they are facing. And the one thing that for a long time women were told to keep it quiet, especially African women, is this idea around love, infusing love in how they bring leadership. Um, and, 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 and it manifests in empathy, um, and, and, you know, a lot of people then said, even when you look at how women have addressed, women leaders have addressed the pandemic, there's this uniqueness about being very authentic in how you present the problem and then being very inclusive. So rallying the community around you to address the problem rather than saying, I have the solution. And that is a unique point that uh, we are all seeing. Um, is something that's very unique to women leadership and we should move forward. Also, one of the other lessons that have been put out there, of course, I think resonates with uh, a lot of what everybody else is talking about, is the need for innovations in, in time of crisis, but not just innovating, but really deliberately trying to stay relevant to the communities that you're serving, so the solutions that you're bringing are to the right people in the right way, um, at the right speed. There's also um, the need for us to think a little bit more strategically about risk management. Uh, women always say we, we always know, you know what's coming, but I think the pandemic has taught us we, all, we don't always know. <laughs> we are very good and agile, um, but perhaps being a little bit more strategic in how we bring solutions, being more prepared, um, and, and especially to juggle all the various roles that we all need to juggle, because when the crisis is there, we don't then take off the hat and say, okay, now I'm a mother. We still need that balance, but at the core is always ensuring that we take care of the woman first. So that's where we're at. Um, I think as we progress, I will come back with the calls to action. Uh, I can already sense where they're okay. headed, and, and, but and, it's a fun and, conversation. Yes. No, brilliant. <laughs> and, and maybe we'll bring some of those up in the Q&As as well. Uh, let's see if we can go to Bayantal in a man. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Hi. Well done. Great. How did it go? <laughs> Well, great. We had a, we had a fantastic discussion. Uh, we exchanged uh, some of the challenges we face and the uh, uh, opportunities raised by uh, the pandemic. Um, we uh, we agree that uh, women need to be in leadership positions uh, in order to challenge stereotypes and uh, um, and and. and uh, we need more collaboration between uh, civil society organizations to ensure equal services are provided to women of all walks of life, and particularly since women were most impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we also agree that the pandemic has forced many women to play multiple roles, as in many other women across the world, and uh, especially uh, mothers. Uh, so it's very important for women to get uh, support 
uh, not just by men, but also to morally help each other. Um, we uh, um, agree that uh, technology, passion, and determination uh, uh, to embrace digital transformation have helped many women-led organizations to perform well during the pandemic, despite the challenges. And we also uh, realize that the pandemic has, met, has presented uh, many solutions and alternative ways of working, forcing us to think out of the box and to be more innovative. Thank you, Tim. No, that's, that's, that, that's great. So the pandemic has created opportunities, which I think has been mirrored in other, in other conversations as well. Before we go just back to Elizabeth, let's just see if we can speak to um, Miriam. Miriam, are you there? Okay, so basically we had a stellar, uh, a stellar panelist who did an amazing, amazing job in recounting to us their experiences, how important is transformative leadership. They spoke about giving women voice and the importance of listening to women and what they have to say and encouraging them to speak, to counter everything related to discrimination, patriarchy, discriminatory laws that govern women and affect them more than men. We spoke about the importance of the younger generation and engaging them. We spoke about the effects of COVID-19 and it has how it has wrecked havoc to everything normal that we, the, that everything normal that we know and how it stopped us from mourning the death. For instance, we talked about how transforming these stories into films is important. The importance of uh, journalists and media professionals countering anything related to gender-based violence, discrimination against women, and the, the good ways in terms of how we can perform as uh, uh, informed citizens, the importance of women's position and decision-making positions, and how uh, uh, giving them a seat should not be uh, something that we ask for. We need to bargain and uh, uh, take what is uh, rightfully ours. And we spoke about the importance of acting as if the 8th of March and International Women's Day is every day. And that's exactly what these women do. They don't wait for International Women's Day to work on gender rights, but this is their lifelong struggle. Uh, they basically had a very important message to the youth, which is keep on fighting, keep your voices heard, and basically don't stop no matter what the impediments and obstacles are. Okay, so every day is International Women's Day. Uh, Elizabeth, let's go back to you, just to up some. We are, I'm just looking actually, and um, we've got a, only a few minutes left, Elizabeth. Do you want to just uh, run through some of your conclusions? Uh, yes. And then we can do some Q and A's, and then all, obviously all these panels can Absolutely. continue once, but, we, but, once we've come off the actual uh, live link. Let me just first congratulate everyone, because really this is not an easy thing to do. And you have pulled together amazing conversations and the findings and the conclusions and, you know, all the, the uh, what you're throwing at us are remarkable conclusions that we need to take on board and we need to act together in the year ahead. So huge congratulations to all of you for what you are achieving and we are achieving today. So going back to the main points in London, from London, uh, well, number one, that things have changed for women in many positive ways over the last 40 years. Uh, it is not the same male dominated world. Uh, women speak up a lot more and they claim our rights and they kind of demarcate you know, our territory. But we need to take on board and always remember that there are countries that have advanced more than others. And so we need to keep listening to what is happening on the ground and we need to keep supporting other women and not become complacent because we know that we are indeed advancing in many ways as women leaders. So uh, then the third point, which I found very important is that we're talking about crisis and actually a multitude of crises that we have been going through as humanity over the last 12 months. Uh, women naturally, we have, we are called to deal with crisis from a very young age from, you know, since we're little girls. And so in many ways, this crisis management skill, it is imprinted in our DNA. Uh, number four, education and parents are very, very important in what, you know, attitudes they nurture, they cultivate among young girls. So let us empower our younger generation of women leaders from that age of three or four years old. 
Uh, last points, I think the fifth one, I mean, we, we had many fantastic points, but uh, my notes for, for uh, as part of this summary, never underestimate the power of being underestimated. And that was made by um, Marjorie Krauss, you know, the woman who within four decades created a global organization. And uh, she's a role model for all of us, I guess, like, I would like to hope that like all of us are for each other, whatever age we are uh, at, whatever culture we come from, I think we have found a way to inspire and learn from each other. And that creates a hugely, uh, you know, important difference for the world. And I thought just listening to Marjorie, who just singled out there, when she was talking about how she started, how in, in the times when she started, she, women had to prove that they were better than men. But I, I also found fascinating her own childhood experiences, having been brought up in a small community with hardworking parents, but that sense of community and responsibility and hard work and pursuing what you wanted to do. And actually, uh, in those days, the sky wasn't the limit, but it is now. Uh, and one other thing that, that, that struck me, Elizabeth, was this idea that social media had changed things so much for women, that the mm. women needed to stop uh, thinking of themselves as princesses uh, and beautiful and everything else, uh, but they need to think of themselves as queens, as builders, uh, as leaders, and, and not just followers as well. And the other themes which came through, just listening to the upsums from the various panels, was this sense of empathy. I don't think any single panel uh, avoided the word empathy and how women, as you've just said in their DNA, had this this ability to deal with crisis, because that was something that physically uh, women uh, were used to doing right from, from, from adolescence, whether it was physical um, or, or intellectual as well, depending on the sort of education structure they had in their, own, um, in, in their own country. Partnerships, collaboration, challenges, um, financial literacy. These are all the themes, I think, Elizabeth, that we've heard over the last three years, um, whereas, People do think there's been a lot of improvement uh, over the past few decades. Uh, there's also now, and again, this was from the London discussion, uh, an idea, I think one of your panelists said that perhaps younger women now had almost forgotten what it was like to be champions in fighting and were too sensitive and too defensive, which was uh, interesting for me to hear because that, that's something I wouldn't have ordinarily perhaps thought. Uh, but so in other words, the gains that have been made need to be protected to continue on the trajectory uh, that women have made. Do you want to just pick up on a, a, on a few of these Q&As, uh, Elizabeth? I don't know who you want to put them to. We've only got a few minutes left. We I'm only have a few minutes through. left, but yes, I would like some of the questions, and there are many that we have received to uh, address them. So, Eve Conway, uh, countries with women leaders in New Zealand and Taiwan have dealt better with the COVID-19 pandemic with 24 deaths and nine deaths respectively. Why do you think this is? So, so I think we covered that for Eve, but does anyone have any comments here that perhaps we didn't uh, make before? We have responded to that, Eve, and it is because uh, women who have led, you know, some of these countries have demonstrated, uh, you know, uh, uh, proactivity. So very quickly, very swiftly, they handle the crisis before it got out of, you know, proportions and out of control. And that was a very important thing, plus uh, empathy and collaboration. Uh, then we have another question from ICE. Poverty in the developing countries is a major reason uh, of women's oppression and for millions of women leaving schools early. How can this be approached and resolved. Who would like to pick up on that? Titi? Yes, sure. Um, can you just repeat that for me? It was breaking up when you were speaking. Yes, we, uh, the question is about poverty in the developing countries as a major reason for, for women being oppressed and for millions of women uh, not concluding their education if they attend uh, school at all. So how can we approach and find a solution for that? I think the discussion around more women or girl children going to school, especially in countries where there is more of the population that suffers from poverty is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. And the best way to address it is probably seeing how the governments can be supplemented to be able to assist 
these children to be able to make it a priority even in the legal structures of a country because currently although we're having conversations around that it's important to have these children educated there is no engagement sometimes of community leaders and really having them see the impact of what happens when you empower the girl child. And I think we've seen the impact across the board in a lot of other countries. And so to make the availability of these statistics or even the practical um, examples of how this can help our communities, especially at a grassroots level is really important. And more so now when you're having a new generation of fathers who are more attuned to this women's empowerment and equity and conversations around the importance of educating the girl child. It's really important to start engaging them and getting them to engage even the elderly leaders in the communities because we're very much based on an honor system in continents such as Africa and we really listen to what our elders have to say. So the onus is on us, the younger generation, to really convince the older generation of the importance of this and then make it something that is the norm as opposed to being um, something that is unique in our communities. Thank you, Titi. Uh, let's take uh, one final question uh, from the audience and that goes to uh, Basma. So where does the sensitivity that you talked about before uh, among you know the young girls in Oman, it, it, it does uh, perhaps the social media uh, factor have to do anything with it? So so how the younger generation of women in Oman perhaps perceive themselves or the world even? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about Oman and the world because we also have from from outside of Oman, and I do definitely agree. Part of it is the social media. And we're seeing a lot of mental issues even more because of the social media. And this is something obviously you've heard before. With the pandemic, it's more because they have more time because of lockdown. So they're very connected to social media. And it's also, I think, the feeling of, def of being defensive. So it's not like they're, they're sensitive. That means they're bad or anything. But it's just they don't tolerate like the older generation. And when I talk about older generation, I'm talking about my generation. So I'm talking about the younger generation um, and how they think about things. Um, they always feel they're in a competition. Um, the moment if somebody talks to them about something, giving them an advice, they'll feel they're, they're being attacked. So this is a problem that I feel in the long run for women would be a big issue because um, in a world like this, you cannot be that sensitive. Um, sensitivity is a beautiful trait, but not when it goes into danger zone, as I call it, because it can bring anger, it can build a lot of self-doubt, low self-esteem. So that was what, um, what I tried to highlight. This is something I've seen um, um, in my practice. I've also read about and I've also researched around the world. It, there is a bit of uh, that happening right now. And it could be because there's a lot of things happening. And um, the way we were brought up maybe is a, a, a bit different from how the new generation is brought, brought up. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I think it's time to conclude. And before handing over to Doug for some final remarks, I would like uh, to hear, you know, a gentleman in this conversation. Uh, why did you switch your camera off? OK. <laughs> I thought you decided to flee. <laughs> no, it's fair. Um, it has been uh, inspirational. And uh, I, I think what came through from, uh, for me was the personal stories of the various panel uh, members of how they fought their own personal battles, um, but embraced um, the, 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 the whole spirit of uh, leadership or, and um, that they actually found that um, spirit of leadership, which drove them on to be uh, a, a gateway for others. And uh, in your summing up, um, it, it was uh, excellent in that uh, it is still asking questions, uh, but the development of, uh, of this, whether it is through companies or, or governments, um, it is a, a need for uh, an ability to learn how to build, develop, build on leadership potential. And I think that is something which came through as well as the entrepreneur side, but it's, it's not an easy uh, task. And I think individuals have to have that strength of character and uh, to broaden that to a wider base is 
what came through from what I was listening to. But it was inspirational. And um, thank you for putting this on again. Well done. Well, thank you for, for your support, Doug and uh, Tim and everyone. I would like to hope that it will be beyond inspirational and it will be, uh, you know, impactful because these are conversations that need to be ongoing. So we are not, you know, closing the conversation now and just switching off and we'll meet again, uh, hopefully in 2022, because of course this is part of the plan. But the main plan is to keep engaging in such conversations and to keep promoting more women uh, to leadership positions, because this world cannot change unless in positive ways, in beautiful ways, in inspiring ways, unless we have more women in uh, decision-making roles. So again, I would like to thank everyone, uh, every single person who has contributed to this amazing conversation. We've had more than 60 speakers from all around the world. Later on today, uh, Oregon and uh, Irvine, California are having their own Athena 40 conversation. So it continues. Stay tuned, stay in touch with us at info at athena44forum.com. Uh, and please uh, make sure that, yes, you are staying connected with this fantastic network of um, con consisting of all genders, and we are all having a mission to advance women in leadership. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.